Le Duke is one of the most dynamic and relevant artists of the late 20th century, living and working in North America today. Her vision encompasses not only her own continent, but reflects both traditional and ever-changing lifestyles in many emerging countries throughout the world. But should an artist merely reflect on canvas what she observes, or should she too take a hand in shaping the future through the power of her creations. From her studio in Southern Oregon, the Duke brings forth all the vivid reality she has observed and absorbed during her latest journey. This might be a healer in Africa, a spirit house in Thailand, children in China, the rites of passage of life and death, or the glorious and changing spectacle of Market Day, experienced in many different lands and cultures. Betty Bernstein's parents were newly arrived immigrants from the Soviet Union and Poland, and Betty was their only child. When Betty reached the age of nine, her mother Helen went to work as a seamstress in a pocketbook factory. This enabled Betty to escape the claustrophobic atmosphere of the Bronx by going to summer camp every year until she was 13. Her art teachers at the camp made a profound impression on the young girl. They were African-American, Charles White and Elizabeth Catlett. And they not only did art and so-called craft activities with us, but they spoke to us, showed us their own work, gave us a sense of what they found meaningful and the kind of community that they identified with. Together, they both described their experiences in Mexico, and I just knew I would have to go there. I think the earliest things I did were self-portraits and images of my father and mother, and I would carry a pencil and a pad with me all the time, and I enjoyed exploring New York. It was just a wonderful place to start out multicultural adventures. It gave me a way of observing slowly and feeling comfortable with people of all different backgrounds. I so wanted to go to Mexico, and then I got noticed that I had been accepted at the Instituto Allende in San Miguel with a scholarship, and I took off, and I finally made it three days later, and it was like incredibly exciting to get a feeling of, of a new landscape, um, a new sense of space. The Instituto was a wonderful experience. The teachers were good for me. They helped me re-see reality um, within a cubist context and to simplify form and to amplify the form into space so that I began to integrate these concepts as well as the impact of seeing many of the old Mayan and Aztec ruins. My second year, um, the scholarship was renewed, but I decided to leave school. I wanted just to paint on my own, so I moved to Guanajuato, and then for one year painted extensively on my own and began to have exhibits, government exhibits. Oh, it was a wonderful experience to feel that the government respected my work, and the reviews were wonderful. Um, the critics seemed to really feel I had captured a quality of Mexico. I was often exhibited with other Mexican artists and counted amongst the new generation of Mexican artists. And I felt very proud. I very seldom sold anything, um, but still that recognition meant a lot to me. In 1956, Betty returned from Mexico to New York. But coming back was not easy for her, as her outlook on so many issues had changed irrevocably. Mostly, I had just had so much freedom and seen in, uh, other ways of thinking and feeling and felt, once again, really confined and trapped in New York. It was at about this time that Betty met Vincent LaDuke, known as Sun Bear. Sun Bear was a very strong political activist on behalf of his Native American people. And I was very much attracted to the political aspect of this man. And we met and decided that we would be together and a whole new chapter of my life developed. 
After working the following summer as counselors in a camp for urban children, Betty and Sunbear traveled to Reno, Nevada, and then on to Los Angeles. Soon, Betty found she was pregnant. During her pregnancy, Betty was filled with the wonder of the changes taking place within her body. She created the sculpture entitled, My Child. Betty's daughter, Winona, was born in 1959. Winona has always been an inspiration and images of her recur continually in Betty's art. Even in the international works, Winona appears, symbolic of women worldwide who strive to maintain their cultural heritage, often in the face of adversity. After teaching art for three and a half years, Betty and Sunbear decided to part. But they kept their special friendship and their relationship to Winona was both committed and strong. In 1964, Betty was offered the position of art instructor at Southern Oregon State College in Ashland, which she accepted. When Winona and I came, we didn't have any friends, and it took a while to develop the long-lasting friendships, which we now have. But at that time, I was amazed at the sense of space. It was once again a side of America I had really never experienced. And I really loved the mountains, the hillsides, the trees. I felt really fortunate that during the first year that I was here, I met Peter Westergaard. And it turned out to be just wonderful for both of us. And very soon our friendship turned into marriage. And there was the beginning of a whole new chapter of my life that is still ongoing. We built a house together, a very simple house, because neither one of us had any money. And at that time, things were relatively inexpensive. And right away, one of the largest rooms in the house was going to be my studio. There was no doubt about that. And 30 years later, I still have not washed the studio floor. La Duke began to paint again, working with acrylic on canvas. I began to explore kids and Winona and Winona's friends and uh, Winona sometimes dashing into the studio hurt. A bee had stung her and that became the subject of my painting after I helped quiet her down. There was another series that I did that was quite exciting because it was Barbie dolls, and I did not like Barbie. Uh, some of the Barbies were um, inane. They were apathetic. They had no opinion of their own. They did just what they were told, and certainly this was not me. These were the years of the Vietnam War and civil rights struggle. La Duke wanted to become involved as a political activist. But motherhood and her new marriage, as well as work pressures, kept her in Oregon. At that time, I was also going through a lot of rage, rage at what was happening politically, and beginning to realize I could use my daughter, Winona, as a metaphor for expressing some of this rage through the symbolism of a child and a doll. So that was one of the paintings that occurred at that time, End of the Whitiness which a black child is throwing down her white doll. It did a series of box paintings in 1969, using Time magazine as the stimulant. At the end of the year, they always have a, a cross-section of uh, some of the important events and wonderful photographs, and I used these photographs to create a series of love totems. Some paintings had holes to where you could look in and there would be a mirror and you would see yourself, where others led to other figures on the opposite side, so there was a, a mixture. And a lot of experimentation with cutting shapes and putting them together. In 1968, I did a painting based on Jean-Paul Sartre's book called No Exit. So this painting was one of several of mine that were placed in Salem at the coffee shop in the Capitol building. Lo and behold, I received a phone call. It was making a big splash. What happened was that a waitress found the painting to be very offensive. Nudes did not belong in the Capitol coffee house. So she had the painting removed by the janitor to his broom closet. And as a result, 
people lined up to see the painting and it received a lot of publicity. I learned very soon on that Oregon wasn't ready for nudes, Oregon wasn't ready for a lot of things, but I was, and I wasn't really going to change who I was for Oregon. Betty and Peter's son, Jason, was born in 1970. Peter is a, an agricultural scientist with a deep commitment to his work, but he really loved the idea of our having a son, and he was the most wonderful father, supportive and caring and loving, and all through the years, I mean, Jason has been very dear to him, and he's never been selfish about giving time uh, to Jason. I sometimes did images that had no real basis in reality, but it was like something that I would sense. And one that I like very much is a painting called Jason Emerging that shows a dark side, a puzzling side, and yet there's a bright, brilliant light, and that's orange, and Jason is holding a bird in his hand and a sense of hope and movement to the future. For a 1972 sabbatical, Betty chose something that would really challenge her. A journey to India. She left Jason with Peter and Winona and went off on her own for one month with a guidebook and a sense of where and what to look for. I loved India. It opened me up to sensuality, to color, to shape, and wonderful linear rhythmic ways that I had never before felt in the West. I began to sense what it was like to be a blind seer and his songs that seemed to echo out into the distance were ageless as though they had always been going on east and west. I enjoyed learning about the lingam shape and Hindu temples and um, the sensuality and sexuality that was a spiritual point of view rather than as we have isolated it in the west to look at it as something negative. I found the Ganges River a remarkable. It was a place where birth and death took place and people made long pilgrimages to get to the Ganges at least once in their lifetime and if they were very old it was hoped that they could die there at that time and then their ashes would be placed in the Ganges and, and set adrift. Little babies, if they died under the age of one, uh, they would be set adrift in the Ganges. And that whole stream of life, the rivers were like a current that cut through a country. And by watching the river, you could see life and death all at once. Marketplaces, I've enjoyed them all over from the Bronx to Timbuktu. Um, they're fabulous in the sense of a place where life is out front. Women sit endless hours with their chickens, and these are very anxious, rambunctious chickens. And the women who sell them are full of gossip and alive, and the interaction is just really exciting. Traveling alone sometimes has tremendous advantages because you make friends. And it was a young Indian man who had been to America and had come back to India to be married. So I was invited to the wedding. And what a thrill. And it took place on a rooftop. I was so surprised that the bride was all dressed in red, while the groom he had a western suit on. They'd met each other through newspaper advertisements. And as they went through the ritual, one part of it dealt with having this, this big massive wool that was in front of them that was very tangled, and they had to sit and untangle it together. So in my painting, I've shown this wool actually wrapped around the bride, and it becomes almost like a harness with the groom pulling on her and controlling her and over her head I've placed the white cow a symbol of fertility because this is what will be expected of her and then the groom already has on his shoulders a little child because the marriage must be consummated with the birth of a male child the relationship Betty has with her daughter Winona is in many ways unique After studying Native American life academically, Winona connected with the extended Laduke family on the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota. She became an important activist for the rights of Native American people throughout the country. There's a time in your life where you're not teaching your child, you're learning from them, and this is what has happened with my relationship with Winona. 
In many ways, she made choices to leave Oregon as her home environment and go back to the environment of her father in the reservation. And certainly with her background and her education, she could really contribute there. In the process, has taught me much about people's relationship to the environment and the importance of respecting Mother Earth and fighting for what you think is important. Jason, the son of Betty and Peter, also gave inspiration to Betty's spiritual and physical journeys. In Thailand, I just love seeing spirit houses. They're ubiquitous everywhere. And they're little houses that are on posts right in front of your own house. And this is where you honor the ancestors. You honor the past and you honor each day by placing offerings for the ancestors and it's your way of greeting the morning. So when I did my own painting, that time Jason was really small, so I placed myself sort of hovering above the spirit house, almost like the great mother. And uh, Jason was within that spirit house, as my thought were with him a great deal. In 1976, Betty received a grant from the Collins Foundation to visit China. The United States China People's Friendship Association was one of the first groups from the West Coast to visit China at that time. I did over 200 sketches making a record of just all the day-to-day -day experiences that we had. China was interested in exposing us to socialism and how it benefits the people. The paintings developed when I came back and I found one of the first ones was uh, one that I call Peking Bicycle Riders. And much to my surprise, because I never like to deal with mechanistic things, I did four men on bicycles, all wearing the same kind of Mao suit and they looked very, very much alike. And it was incredible to see in a city of like nine million people, six million of them on bicycles all at once. I enjoyed very much the experiences we had with children and seeing ample nursery schools and seeing the wonderful love lavished on Chinese children. Uh, they were little butterballs of color because it was cold and their clothes were very well padded and they were padded too. So much of my imagery from China was realistic, but at the very end I did one painting that's quite different and I call it China, Memories of the Bitter Past. That phrase, memories of the bitter past, we heard repeated again and again. And it's like people had lived through so much and the past had been so bitter that they were always comparing what they had now. So the painting then is all these heads, all these faces of people, sort of memories of these faces as they were talking to us and saying memories of the bitter past. Papua New Guinea inspired a series of birthing images in it, the woman was always transforming herself and giving birth, and also, it's not an awesome experience. It's something that's natural and very much a part of life and very much a part of their sculptures. And for example, um, uh, they call these uh, hooks, suspension hooks, and you find them inside the thatch huts, and they're suspended from the ceiling beams for their goods to keep them away from rats. But these forms are very numerous. They have a variety of shapes and some of them are very playful and some of them are male, female. And somewhere that became important for my work because um, in dealing with male and female and the unity of all life forms, I could then use that energy and, and create it in different ways and recreate it as circular shapes, half moon shapes, and imagine from it. From 1981 till 1984, I kept on going back to Latin America. Chile uh, brought me into contact with a regime that was very oppressive at that time, and people who spoke up in any way against this regime were attacked, including teachers and students, and disappeared. And as a result, a lot of middle-class women became involved in protesting what was going on. And I did a painting of those little devils with the children, and that was my contact with a sense of of people who looked well, basically they were dressed okay, but malnutrition was rampant and there was a dazed look in their eyes. 
The woman is like a strong tree and within her body she has many, many heads and the heads are the people and in a sense the suffering and the anguish and in a way this is an homage to the mothers of the Cinco de Mayo of Argentina and El Salvador wondering what happened to their children. But they persevere and the uplifted arms that turn into birds is a sense of their coming together and reaching upward to make change, to make a difference and not let the world forget what has happened to them so it doesn't happen again. I started going to Africa in 1986 and it was sort of a natural outgrowth after Latin America because I'd begun to see the African influence there, especially in countries like Haiti, Brazil, um, the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, and so on. But when I started painting, it seems I turned back to my favorite theme, and that was the market women. But they were wonderful and elegant, and they had head wrappers, which were like two yards of cloth wrapped around their heads. So as I started to paint my bird woman, um, they became bird women because the head wrappers opened up and sort of unraveled upwardly and sort of sprouted wings. So it was an honoring of the woman, so I call my painting Bird Woman, Keepers of the Peace. A country that I absolutely enjoyed was Senegal. The light is extraordinary because this is a country that's on the coast. And in one village, a fishing village, the men did the fishing and brought the fish back early in the morning. And the women came and they sat on the dock with the fish. It almost seems like the fish were their children. And they were reenacting this great creation, that this great magical dance of women and men and, and food and life. Africa opened me up to a sense of vibrancy so that when I saw this woman who was selling fish, and it wasn't just fish she was selling, but she did it with pride. Um, and the great fish above her head is like her head wrapper opened up and within it I also put cowrie shells. I began to use cowrie shells because cowries are such an important part of African imagery in a sense. I'm sure it inspired so many paintings, this wonderful goddess that people paid homage to. In many ways, it related back to my own personal life. I couldn't believe it. Like, for example, when Winona was uh, about to give birth to her second child, I began to think and remember and feel Oshun, this wonderful goddess, nurturer of life. And then I drew in my sketchbook Winona as the great mother with one child, Wase, already there, Wase Abin, and her second child already nursing at her breast. The healer contains within her so many of the sources of what will become powders and herbs that will be used for medicinal purposes, and also stars because she deals with the future. She foresees how to help you, so that it's not only a physical healing, but a psychic healing. An exciting thing happened when I had this painting made into a poster, and the response to people from all over the U.S to this image and a tremendous uh, desire to, to have it. But this was possible because I now had made some of my Africa images into note cards and into posters. I was traveling in St. Petersburg and stopped in a women's bookstore and um, there I saw a rack of greeting cards and I saw this fabulous image there, the healer. And so I very boldly was on the phone with Betty and I asked her if the painting was still available and if it was for sale. And we became friends through this process and eventually she sold me the healer. And it's been my most treasured piece of artwork since then and fits very much in with the theme of other works that I have in my collection. And the things that I like the best about Betty's paintings are their dramatic use of color, um, the very approachable faces of the people, just the animated quality of every figure and her paintings. Mostly the things that I collect are uh, very rich in color, but the collection has really grown so much over the past many years, and because of the inclusion of works of art like Betty's paintings, it has given me the idea that maybe someday I'd like to open the house to the public as a museum so that people can come and enjoy art in a home environment where art is seen as a part of a way to live rather than uh, in a conventional museum where everything is quite sterile and removed from daily life. 
Going to Kenya was another experience that was very eventful for me. It was amazing, amazing to see massive amounts of animals moving and migrating and the way they interweave with each other. And they don't become one animal, they become massive animal shapes. I saw women walking in the distance and it seemed that their bodies moved into the zebra's bodies so that they had very elongated heads. Throughout Africa, there are many nations within nations, and amongst them are the Maasai people of Kenya. I was first taken by their stunning physical beauty. They're very tall, they're very elegant, and they're hunter-gatherer peoples. And in the painting, Africa, Maasai Spirit Quest, I show a group of Maasai people moving out in the distance with their animals, and part of that coming to age is going through a spirit quest where they have a vision that becomes part of their own identity. In Nigeria, I saw so many lizards, and they're a sign of fertility, so people love them, and they also eat the insects. So I began to observe their movements and ended up doing this painting, which is really a playful interaction between male and female. Textures integrate because that's what I felt really identified the African environment for me in the tropical forest area. In many parts of Africa, millet is the main staff of life, the main food. And going through the countryside, one sees women stooped over with children on their backs, cutting the weeds away from the young millet plants. And as they move and work together, their bodies seem to blend into the millet. The millet enters into their bodies and into the huts, which uh, are part of the landscape behind them. And in this case, the huts became bird-like, as the very roof line, thatched roof, reminded me of the birds flying in the distance. Sometimes artists feel like they're so ineffective in terms of dealing with important social issues and therefore it was like really wonderful when Freedom From Hunger felt that my work was symbolically uplifting and if I visited their project sites in Africa to begin with, the images I might bring back might then be used by them for their information bulletin. And during this two-year time period, I would sketch and photograph and interview people and work on a book to represent exactly what it feels like to be in these countries and how this organization is trying to interface and to activate the woman and to um, amplify the positive potential within their life experiences so that they can deal with some of these basic issues. Winona's two children, Wasiaben, which means first light of dawn, and Arjuawak, meaning to cross the stream safely, visit their grandmother on the campus of Southern Oregon State College. They are eager to hear all about Africa and to see the painting, African Spirits Rising. The painting was created in response to Freedom From Hunger Project sites in Ghana and Burkina Faso. And the woman, at this point, became very joyous for me. Uh, joyous in what was happening because of their coming together and building solidarity and feeling that they could plan for the future because the work that they normally do would give them more profit and alleviate some of the problems of chronic hunger and malnutrition. So the joy is there, and it's in their bodies, and their arms are uplifted. I think for myself, I've learned that it's really better to separate economics from, from your art. And that may sound ridiculous, but it's been the truth of my life. But even within that, there's a lot of juggling. But this juggling act is a pleasure because it's allowed me to grow as a human being and uh, to see myself in relationship to other artists, be inspired by their work, and uh, to, to enjoy it. I mean, to enjoy the process because um, we're only here once and it's important that we leave something that in a way said something about what our experiences have been and how we interact with people and how we interact with other cultures. Betty LaDuke, artist, writer, activist and visionary. Her journey from the Bronx to Timbuktu has taken many, many years. Years of hard work and complete dedication to her vision as she has chosen to present it like the flight of birds in her paintings. 
so her works reach upward to a new universe of dignity and integrity.